Hi, everyone. Welcome to a, another KE Report webinar. I'm your host, Corey Fleck. This webinar is being produced in conjunction with Focus Communications. In this webinar, we are featuring DevStream. This company is currently private, but will be listing in the very near term. From DevStream, we have Sonny Trin joining us. He is the CEO. Before we get into DevStream, because the company is focused in the carbon credit market, we're bringing on a special guest, David Quesada. He is the Managing Director of Equity Research at Raymond James. Now, David, you and I are going to have a little conversation here on how Raymond James is viewing this emerging carbon credit market and some of the factors that you are looking for within companies. So everybody, a couple housekeeping items that I should let you all know. You will be able to ask questions throughout David's presentation, as well as Sunny Trin over at DevStream. Please use the chat and Q&A function within this webinar uh, platform. I will be interjecting questions throughout both presentations, as well as at the end, quick Q&A session, depending on how much time we have. After this webinar, if you have any follow-up questions for the company or for David, you can always email me. My email address is Fleck at kereport.com. David, let's start off here simply from a high level. Take us through uh, Raymond James, broad overview of the credit market, more from an investment angle, please. Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for having me, Corey. And I would just say that uh, really pleased to uh, have an opportunity to give some thoughts here ahead of Sunny's presentation, uh, certainly on behalf of uh, my partners here at RJ. You know, I think that... Um, we certainly seek to partner with companies like DevStream that we feel like have the right team and positioning uh, in the market to create real shareholder value, which is, you know, I think why we're all on this call today. So, uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, maybe I'll start with, if it's OK with you, with why I think investors should care about this space. Uh, you know, one, one day I think carbon is going to be mentioned in the same breath as many clean tech industries that have added significant shareholder value over time. Things like wind, solar, storage. And I would point out that actually that a lot of the carbon um, investments we see being made today are actually quite a bit higher return than those those other asset classes I just talked about. But you know, there's been a lot of volatility in the space recently. Many of you will have noticed the swings in the in the price of the European emissions credits and the related ETFs. As an analyst, I try to stay focused on long-term fundamentals and the underlying premise here that there's a monstrous pool of demand for high-quality carbon offsets. That's not changed at all. Uh, think of a company like Microsoft uh, that plans to offset all the emissions it was created, it has had since it was created in 1975. That's 7 million tons of carbon. Think of energy players like Shell, for example. The volume of carbon offsets these companies need will be staggering. Shell alone in turn, intends to uh, purchase 120 million tons worth of carbon offsets by 2030. That's over a third of the whole voluntary carbon offset market today. And, you know, frankly, emissions and carbon exposure in general is a risk that companies are going to need to manage these days. Can a company provide a carbon neutral by 2050 commitment and then back out of it because it's expensive? I think the answer to that is no. And I believe that because as an analyst, we've seen many instances of lower valuations for companies that are perceived to have higher risk. Even if you take the most pessimistic attitude towards these large oil and gas players and what their intentions are, I think you can rely on the fact that they will act in the best interests of their uh, share price over time. So, and then, and then, as as we mentioned, from an investor's point of view, you know, I think it's worth noting that in many cases these credits sell under long-term contracts. There's a lot of upside to higher credit prices over time, which is something that we firmly believe in that the trajectory is going to be higher over time. And uh, not only that, but these. So, so that as a result of that, these projects are very attractive on a risk-adjusted basis. And in addition to that, carbon credits are very uncorrelated with other commodities. So, uh, you know, as an asset class, I think you really want to have exposure to it. And it has some great diversification characteristics as well. So in terms of market outlook, then, David, th this market is relatively new. It is actually quite new. And the mm -hmm. growth prospects are quite astronomical when you talk about companies not just trying to offset their carbon output starting today, but even looking back to offset that carbon output. What's the growth profile that you see for the carbon credit market? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So uh, the first thing I'll point out is that over the past three years, we've already seen substantial growth. It's been a CAGR, uh, a cumulative annual growth rate of more than 50% over the past few years. Uh, there's a, a 
an organization called the Task Force on Scaling Voluntary Carbon Markets. They estimate demand for carbon credits could increase by a factor of 15 by 2030, by which time the market would be would be the total value of transactions in a year would be around $50 billion. Uh, that, that compares to about $1 billion today. So huge potential growth in the market. You know, the, I think when you when you look at it, uh, you know, again, from a fundamental perspective, there are, of course, technologies out there that will contribute to decarbonization. But there's no way around the fact that these technologies and the infrastructure required to support them can take a really long time to deploy. I follow end markets like hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, direct air carbon capture, all pretty closely. And, you know, they're exciting technologies, but the truth is they're hugely expensive. And actually, one of the great things about carbon credits is they can provide the added financial incentive that's necessary uh, or, you know, will make them economically feasible so they can reach scale and bring the costs uh, of those technologies down. So I guess what I would say is, you know, we're, we're very constructive on the growth of the industry. We're very constructive on carbon credit pricing. You know, uh, estimates out there range between $30 a ton and $130 per ton for carbon credits by 2030. I can tell you that either one of those outcomes is very bullish for a company like DevStream. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the bottom line is I would say that uh, there's an urgent need for carbon offsets. It's, it's not just that you can make a case for them. There's a real need for it. And uh, it's an all hands on deck approach. Every every technology, uh, every type of carbon offset project is necessary. And it's probably also important to point out that a large portion of the projects that you're seeing out there today are nature based solutions. In my view, you need you need all kinds. There are te technological type and technology based carbon offset projects, which I'm sure Sunny will talk about. Um, so you need a, you need a broad portfolio or exposure to a broad portfolio of which technology based carbon offsets very much fit. Uh, and that, that's a differentiated model that, in my understanding, DevStream has. Okay. So bullish on the sector broadly, we can also see a number of new companies coming into this sector, right? DevStream isn't the only company that is new in the carbon credit space. What do you look for in carbon credit companies, especially because most of them are so new? Oh, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, you know, when we look at a carbon offset company, a couple of key things we look for, and those are the team that you're investing in ultimately and the pipeline of carbon offset projects that that company is cultivating. When we assess the projects specifically, there are a few things we want to see. We want to see that they're defensible from a scientific perspective, that they're very measurable with a reliable baseline that proves that they're actually sequestering or absorbing carbon over and above a business as usual scenario, and that they provide uh, some form of meaningful social benefits. A company's model is important too. Each of these offset projects have many stakeholders. Alignment among the local community, the local government, the project developer, and the carbon offset investor absolutely has to be there. This is actually one of the big reasons why we are fans of the streaming model in the carbon offset space. Um, diversification within a, a given company's portfolio is important too. You know, there are a wide range of carbon offset projects out there today. The prices they can trade at differ significantly. Uh, many of them today are arranged by, you know, bilateral negotiation. Uh, but I would suggest that many of the buyers are, are relatively new to the game. Their preferences will shift as they become more sophisticated. Um, so really, you want, you want to invest in companies that can deliver on the promises they're making. Uh, companies with the experience to get involved in developing projects, the contacts uh, with, with end customers to be able to sell those credits over time, and, and actually companies that are well-positioned for the future to be able to integrate technology. I think one day the carbon credit space will become increasingly standardized and credits will likely trade largely on exchanges. So having technological competency is also something we really look for. Um, and, a, and a final point I'll make here is that, you know, in many cases, carbon credits really do achieve the goal of doing well by doing good. You know, in my time following the space, I've been impressed by the degree to which these projects can actually benefit local communities and also the degree of of rigor, if you will, that the agencies who issue the carbon credits use when measuring the carbon that these projects uh, absorb. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, that, that's kind of a, a high level look at, at, at uh, what, what we look for in a company. Okay, got it. Now, can you break down the difference between nature-based and technology-based solutions? We have a question that came in. Why yeah. are so many companies focused on nature-based? Let's start out by differentiating the two. Sure. Yeah, no, that's a really important distinction. Nature-based uh, would fall into the category of, uh, you know, things that are obviously out in nature already uh, absorbing carbon, like uh, you could be some projects that are called Red Plus, 
are preventing deforestation or promoting sustainable forestry. Some of them are uh, afforestation, which is planting uh, or building a forest, planting a forest in an area where there wasn't one before. Reforestation is a big one. There was a forest there. Now it's gone. You replant there. Uh, and there are also ones, uh, credits called blue carbon, which are mangrove forests, which are actually very effective at sequestering carbon. And then the other ones would be uh, some of the things we just talked about, uh, renewable power, uh, clean cook stoves, more, more uh, energy efficient light bulbs. Um, you know, things like that, the things that involve some kind of technological uh, construction. Okay. And then to your point, just real quick, when it comes to the buying and selling of carbon credits, there are exchanges out there right now, right? But uh, it's a bit of a foggy landscape. That, yeah, that's a fair point. There are there are exchanges that are in development. Uh, I think that they're actually making pretty good progress. And that's going to be a huge um, milestone for the industry. It, they, these projects are all very different. So it will take time and uh, I think there will be grades of them. It'll be hard to just, uh, you know, put them all into one bucket. But, uh, you know, I think I think the reason that there's been a market preference for nature based credits is because um, they're very accessible. It's easy to understand that, you, you know, you go out and plant some trees and that's a good thing from a carbon perspective. Um, one of the one of the limitations of, of course, of planting trees is that you have to wait for them to grow and they don't actually really start sequestering a lot of carbon until they reach, you know, seven or eight years into their growth cycle. Uh, whereas implementing some kind of technology today is pulling carbon out of the atmosphere immediately. Okay. Uh, David, we're going to move on. We're going to get Sonny back in here to discuss DevStream. We do really appreciate you taking your time, though, and sharing some of just a quick overview here on the carbon credit market. I will be having you back on our show. That is the Coil and Economics Report to discuss this sector as it continues to develop. But Sonny, welcome to the webinar. We will fire up the slides right now. I will get those going. And if you could, please uh, take us through generally the story of DevStream. As I mentioned, I will be interjecting questions throughout. So everybody keep asking your questions. And Sonny, please give us a little insight on DevStream, please. Great. Well, thank you, Corey. Um, it's great to be here with you and David to discuss carbon streaming. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to share the uh, DevStream story with everyone. Um, DevStream is an investment, uh, carbon investment company that invests in projects that help address climate change while generating carbon credits. I do like to think that we're way more than just a carbon streaming investment company, and that's indicative of our company mission, which is that we at DevStream believe that all the solutions necessary to reverse climate change exist in the world today. However, there are some major barriers, such as funding and geographical limitations, that prevent most of them from moving forward. Our mission is to help remove these barriers to accelerate the implementation of these solutions and allow them to work to their full potential. And because climate change is such a massive problem, we look for and work with a wide range of projects with most of them being technology-based solutions. Uh, we currently have over 50 projects that we're evaluating. And actually, let me move forward a little bit. So, um, yeah, so I mentioned, we currently have over 50 projects that we're evaluating and have some great partnerships, both of which we'll cover later in the, in the presentation. Along with our diversified portfolio, many of our projects and credits address all three facets of uh, ESG, environmental, social, and governance. All streaming companies focus on the environmental piece, which is, is extremely important and the main reason we're here. In addition to that, we look for projects that also have a social impact. And David touched on that a little bit as well, too. Along with helping the environment, we have projects that also benefit the local people and communities. And I'll start with one, one simple example. Um, one of our new projects is connected to one of the Great Lakes in Africa, where there are hundreds of megatons of methane and carbon dioxide trapped at the bottom, ready to be released in the environment once it gets saturated sometime in the near future. At the same time, the communities surrounding this lake is incredibly poor with access to very little energy or fuel for cooking. Much of the fuel in this area is dependent on the nearby forest, which has been decimated, and is now roughly 85% deforested. This in turn increases the cost of this fuel, which comes in the form of charcoal, which also adds to our carbon problem. The average family in this area spends 40% of their income on charcoal. Now imagine that, 40% of your income on charcoal. And for many of the families that can't afford this, they send their children, young boys and girls, to walk for miles through extremely dangerous areas to collect firewood and bring it back. So what our project will do is build a facility to collect the methane from the lake and use it to provide low-cost electricity and fuel to the local communities. This will also provide jobs to thousands of people and stop the continued deforestation of the nearby forest. So you can see a project like this not only helps the environment, it will change the lives of thousands of people in the surrounding area. Sonny, when it comes to these 50 projects under evaluation, this is just out of the gate. Where do you guys, how do you guys source all of these projects? 
Yeah, a big part of it is is our, our network and and also our experience. So I come from the semiconductor space and for almost three decades where we worked with literally hundreds and hundreds of companies, many of which are playing in the or, or participate in the renewable energy uh, or energy efficiency space that fits really well for the carbon credit model. We also also have relationships with the Devio and uh, United Cities North America, which we'll touch on a little bit as well, which provides additional uh, uh, leads for, for, for new projects. Okay, thank you. So now let's take a look at the people behind DevStream. Uh, starting with myself, um, I have an engineering background with a bachelor's and master's degree in general engineering from Harvey Mudd College. Uh, I've worked in the technology and semiconductor space, as I mentioned, for over 25 years. Uh, most of my time was spent at the two largest semiconductor distributors where I worked with hundreds of companies, many of which, I, like I said, are in the energy efficiency and renewable energy space. Uh, about two years ago, I started diving into the carbon credit world and noticed that a lot of these companies were doing things that were eligible for carbon credits, but none were doing anything about it. So I reached out to a couple of them and found out that they either didn't know about carbon credits or felt that it was too difficult. So I asked a couple of them if I gave them some money up front to really fund their project and help move it along, would they be willing to transfer the rights to the carbon credits? And every single one of them gave a resounding yes because of them, it was free money and it would help them drive um, more, more projects. That's when I realized that we have a really interesting business model. And with my years in electronics distribution, like I said, I have access to hundreds of these companies. And this was the beginning of Dash Ring. Uh, next is our chief operating officer, Chris Merkel. Chris and I have worked together for a long time in the technology and semiconductor space. He too has worked with hundreds of technology companies and done a lot of project management and systems integration, uh, which, which makes him a great fit for the role. Then we have uh, Dr. Destiny Nock, our chief sustainability officer. She has a PhD in environmental engineering and policy and is also an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon. She helps us evaluate the viability of our projects along with analyzing their social impact. She also provides us with a thorough analysis of the number of credits we can expect from a specific project. Uh, our CFO, David Gertz, has had a ton of experience in technology in the mining sector, so he understands the streaming model extremely well. He's also taken quite a few companies public in Canada and has been a huge asset in allowing us to uh, have a smooth IPO. And then last on this list is, uh, is Brian Wentz, our chief revenue officer. Brian has had uh, or has been a serial entrepreneur and has founded and guided quite a few companies in tech, blockchain, sustainability, and carbon credits. Some of these companies uh, that he's founded include an alternative fuel car engine company that he started when he was 16 and an LED lighting company, uh, which he started also before LEDs were widely used. His experience and uh, also vast network makes him a great addition to our team. Sonny, how many of these individuals had you worked with prior to DevStream? Sounds like you have a relationship with some of them. Yeah, um, pretty, pretty much uh, um, all of them. Uh, Dave Gertz, I met a little bit before, probably before DevStream, but uh, Chris, I've known for a decade. Brian, I've known for a decade. And uh, Dr. Destiny Nock, I've known for a couple of years through uh, my relationship with Devio. So did the idea for DevStream all come together as kind of a team here? It has, yeah. Yeah, we all uh, add little pieces to it. But that, uh, but yeah, there was a gap. And uh, and also tying it to technology, we were able to kind of come together and put, put together a model for, for DevStream. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then for our board, uh, we start with our chairman, Tom Anderson. Tom, too, is an engineer and the founder and CEO of Devio. He's the brainchild behind Devio's proprietary blockchain, which is being used by DevStream. And again, we'll go over that in a little bit as well. Uh, Tom has had several successful exits with other technology companies he's founded. Uh, next is Will Stewart, who has also been in technology for nearly three decades, running multiple venture capital funds and investing over $5 billion across roughly 400 tech companies, some of which have been unicorns. Uh, Will currently serves as chairman of Expansive. Uh, another director is Ray Quintana. He has a physics background and also has two decades in global technology investment, including being a general partner of the top performing early stage VC fund in the US. And last but not least is Steve Kakucha. Steve has um, over two decades in clean tech, renewable power, and public policy. He's held multiple roles in fuel cells and energy councils for both the US and Canadian government. So as you can see, um, technology is all over De DevStream's DNA and is the main reason why we have such a focus in that area. Uh, even the nature-based projects that we're looking at will have technologies such as IoT carbon sensors tied to them to make them even better. Sunny, how active are all of these board of director members in the company and what type of doors do they open? They all sound like they come from slightly different aspects. Yeah, no, all of them are extremely active. I actually have calls with them on a regular basis. Seems like almost every day I'm talking to one of the directors. 
So um, this is one of the most active board that I've ever uh, worked with. So it's, 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 it's a very nice change. And they, like you said, Corey, they have incredible relationship. The network is, between this group is, is unbelievable. Uh, pretty much any company that we want to work with, they have some form of relationship with, usually at a high level. So um, as far as finding new deals and then finding partners to work these deals, having these four folks on our board is, is a huge, huge benefit for that. Uh, any more info on Will Stewart as well? Quick question just came in on Will saying that uh, he he's well known. He has a lot of access to capital. So how involved is he? Yeah, Will's one of the more, uh, more involved um, board members. Not, not, not that the other three aren't. But um, gosh, I mean, I probably talk to Will every few days and um, he's constantly sending me uh, emails with uh, recommendations and uh, other ideas and so forth. So um, he is extremely active. And then his tie to expansive is, is also very helpful um, on the exchange side. Okay, let's move on. Thank you, Sonny. Thank you. So um, for those who are not quite familiar with carbon credits, let's just take a moment to discuss what they are. Uh, a carbon credit is a tradable permit or certificate that provides the holder of the credit the right to emit one ton of carbon dioxide or equivalent greenhouse gas in order to reduce one's carbon footprint. Carbon credits are generated by projects that reduce or eliminate these emissions. This provides a vehicle for companies that have emissions to fund projects that reduce emissions. The idea behind carbon credits is sound, but there are two major hurdles that exist. First, generating and certifying carbon credits is long, expensive, and complicated. This is the main reason that companies I originally spoke to didn't do anything with carbon credits. Second, many projects need money up front to get started before they can generate a single carbon credit. This is especially true with technology-based projects. This is where DevStream comes in by providing the initial upfront capital and handling the entire certification process, re remove these barriers and allow these projects to work the way they were meant to. Uh, Sonny, real quick, when you talk about these companies, uh, when it comes to point one, they're generating and certifying carbon credits. It's complicated. There are companies out there that are generating carbon credits. They're just not tracking them. Is there any way to go back and obtain those prior carbon credits or is it more a process of looking forward? Yeah, it's a process of looking forward because there's a piece called additionality. So if projects already happen that potentially could generate credits, well, they didn't really need the carbon credits to help finance that project. And so... Um, for, in, in order to um, to meet that additionality requirement, the, the funding for the carbon credit has to play a part in enabling the project to happen. And so that will only happen with new projects moving forward. Okay, thank you. Yep. The next question with carbon credits is how much we can sell them for once we generate them. And David touched on this a little bit as well too. Um, the price range from a uh, the, the price of the carbon credit ranges from a couple dollars to over $200, with the average being around $15 for the voluntary market is what we've been seeing. Um, the high end of the range are outliers and are from a few fringe DAC technologies or direct air capture technologies that are only sequestering a few thousand tons per year. Uh, the low end are from older credits that aren't necessarily certified or properly certified. Since our credits will be fully certified, uh, we'll also have full transparency through WS blockchain and also a social impact, like the example I made earlier, we expect to get above average returns for them. Looking forward, we along with just about everyone else, including David, and again, he touched on this, everyone else in the carbon space expect the prices of carbon credits to go up. The reason is because as more and more companies, organizations, and even cities and countries strive to reduce their carbon footprint and pledge to be net zero, almost all of them will have to buy carbon credits. For example, let's say you're a company that makes toys. You'll need to acquire materials, ship them to your factory, make the toys at your factory, package them, and then ship them to your distributors. I know this is a very simplified model of this toy business, but every single step of the way will require our produced emissions today. And until all our electricity is renewable and all our transportation has been electrified, this company and almost every other will have a positive carbon footprint. So how can it offset all these emissions in order to be net zero? They will have to purchase carbon credits. So for every metric ton of carbon dioxide or equivalent gas, they will have to buy one carbon credit. And this is something that they will have to do every year they're in business. Now imagine how many companies or organizations out there that are making this net zero pledge, and not just in the US or Canada, but worldwide. These are all the companies and organizations that will need to buy a carbon credit. And now you see why we feel that carbon credits will be one of the most sought after assets in the world and will continue to be so for many years. So bottom line is that uh, there won't be enough carbon credits to go around. Uh, David earlier mentioned that the task force on scaling voluntary carbon markets estimates that demand for carbon credits uh, will grow by 15x by 2030, uh, 
What else you, uh, you can add to that is that they expect it to grow by 100x by 2050. So this in turn will drive prices higher. And, and Corey, I mean, can you think of any other market with this kind of demand and growth potential? So this is why investors should be paying attention to carbon credits right now. And, and then well, lastly, we can't forget, it's one major tool we have to help solve climate change. Yeah, well, that's the other aspect too, right? That hits on a lot of new investors' uh, motivation behind investing. But a couple of quick questions then regarding carbon credits. Why does the price change so significantly? Is it different types of credits? Why do we have this range of $2 to $200? Yeah, there, there are different types of credits. Like I mentioned before, there's ones that aren't certified. There are ones that aren't creating that uh, type of impact. Uh, but also, uh, having that trust and transparency and having all the data, again, that's why we use the blockchain, increases the value of the credits. And also there's different types of credits. So there's certain nature-based ones that are more status quo, and I'll touch on that a little bit. And then while there's other technology ones that are pulling carbon out of the air, and David touched on that uh, as well. Um, and then uh, on top of that, the, uh, it depends on when the credits were generated. So the older credits are going to be a lot less expensive, where the, the newer ones, the ones that are happening right now, you can... Uh, uh, achieve a lot higher pricing for those. Why are they more expensive if they fundamentally do the same thing, offset carbon output? No, that's, that's a good question. Part of it too is the companies that are buying them. If it fits their business model better, they can use it for uh, for marketing purposes. But then also they, uh, the credits that are actively sequestering as opposed to uh, reducing or keeping the status quo will generate more as well too. So there's some nature-based projects that essentially you're keeping status quo because you're not chopping down trees, right? So those aren't really adding to the solution. It's, it's uh, keeping from getting worse. Okay. So those are wouldn't generate as much uh, on value. Okay. So what you're essentially saying is the carbon credits you guys aim to uh, achieve and build up, those are the highest quality. Those are the more expensive ones. Yeah. In, in short, yes. <laughs> okay. Got it. Um, can we look at the other side of the carbon credit? A market here we've heard nothing but bullish aspects what are some of the risks to this market yeah no that's that's a really good question um you know i think you know one of the question there is tied that risk is is there a chance that this sector becomes obsolete right in, mm -hmm. in, in the time of deglobalization and, and really until the entire world is running on renewable energy or all gas-powered vehicles and tools are electrified like i mentioned earlier this sector this sector will not be obsolete in other words, at least parts of the world will still have emissions from fossil fuel, burning power plants, gas combustion vehicles, and factories for, for, for many, many years to come. And when you consider the large number of developing nations out there that don't even have the basic necessities, such as clean water, and reliable energy, we're far from this full transformation. So this market's not going anywhere. So first of all, so number one, there's going to be a lot less risk uh, of that happening. Um, and so I would say the biggest risk to the current market is that you're going to have people and companies who are only in it to chase the money. So you'll have the junk carbon credits that don't really do what they're claiming to do. And that's where you get the lower price ones as well. So the pricing will be big to that. Uh, or you also have nature-based ones that overestimate the carbon impact because a lot, they use a lot of models. And I'll give you an example of that in a little bit as well. So this is also why we're bringing blockchain into the industry to provide that full provenance and transparency to each credit to reduce that risk. But overall, I would say this, this market is much less risky than in most of the markets that you're going to see out there. Okay. You know, it's funny. We can move on. Just a couple notes too. We we will get to the the point of when the stock will be trading and what symbol it will trade on. We're just not quite there yet, but there have been a couple questions on that aspect. We'll cover it when we get there, but we can move on now, Sonny. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. So um, as I mentioned before, the projects we invest in go way beyond the nature-based ones. Um, like David mentioned, I mean, they are fairly popular right now. And, and you know, I think a big reason is because there aren't many good alternatives. But I think that in the long run, people will start moving away from them for several reasons. Uh, first, many of them are, like I said, maintaining the status quo, right? not doing anything to actively reduce emissions. When you uh, pay a force reserve to not chop down trees, it is important. But again, it only keeps us out of the current state. Nature-based nature projects that goes beyond keeping the status quo, such as reforestation projects, are also extremely important. But as David mentioned earlier, right, they would take a significant amount of time before they start making an impact. So there is a gap that needs to be filled in order to address this massive problem of global warming. And that's where technology-based solutions come into play. And secondly, the uh, data from these projects um, are only estimates calculated from models. And, and I'm referring to nature-based projects. So they're easy to, to manipulate and overestimate. Um, I just recently, recently read an article on two projects that were supposed to protect Colombia's Amazon in order to meet uh, 2030 emission goals. 
Third party investigators found that both projects use inflated baselines to calculate emission credits and overstated their climate impact by millions of tons. Our projects, the technology based projects, on the other hand, will have precise data going into the blockchain where every calculation and transaction can be viewed by all stakeholders. And then the third benefit of a um, technology based solution is that they can be duplicated and replicated all over the world. The type of projects we, uh, we invest in fall into four major categories. Uh, improving energy efficiency, providing alternative renewable energy, reducing or limiting emissions, and, uh, and finally direct capture and sequestration of greenhouse gases from the environment. Uh, Sunny, let's just quickly touch on then um, some of the advantages that DevStream has in terms of project sourcing, project development, and commercialization. So not just the finding of the deals, moving them through the chain. Yes, since um, we focus on technology, we have many, many options to choose from, right? A nature base is just a nature base. Um, if you take a look at, like, example, for uh, just energy efficiency projects alone, we probably have over a dozen different options. Plus, um, you know, like I mentioned, with our decades of experience and um, network, along with our partnerships, we have a continuous flow of potential projects. Um, as for commercialization and development, uh, this bright range of options also gives us short-term and long-term projects to choose from, along with ones of different sizes. Uh, for example, the, uh, an LE light bulb swap can be implemented in a couple months, while a much larger, say, like 100 megawatt solar installations would be closer to 24 months. And so we have a plenty of options to choose from and to also fill the fill funnel. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So um, as I mentioned before, we uh, currently have over uh, 50 projects in our funnel. Uh, from this funnel, we've been able to narrow down to about eight really high ROI projects that we now have agreements with. And even with almost zero marketing, we've been able to generate a, a really large and continuously flowing pipeline of projects. Um, this further reinforces the value of our model and with more leads coming in weekly from multiple sources. Uh, like I said, including our network, our relationship with Devio, our relationship with United Cities, uh, which we'll touch on in a little bit. And having a long list of projects to choose from allows us to select ones that have the highest environmental and social impact which in turn will yield more high quality carbon credits and provide us and our investors with a much higher um, ROI. So Sunny, is there a general model that you build out where say you have $10 million, how many carbon credits can you yield through a $10 million investment? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question. Our models, we try to keep it fairly simple. Um, it mainly um, is that our investment on average should have a two year payback period with a minimum stream of 10 years. And that's based on today's average pricing of $15 for a carbon credit. So for a $10 million investment, we expect to get at least $5 million worth of credits annually. Uh, and using today's average pricing, that would be roughly 333,000 credits per year. Okay. I think that's a key to also understand too. It's not just the payback period time. It's the length of time that you can still generate the carbon credits. No, that, that's correct. We, we look for a minimum stream of 10 years, but some of our projects will go up to 30 years. Okay. Thank you. Here we have a, a list of some of our projects with the, the potential to generate a, a substantial amount of uh, carbon credits annually. And as you can see from this list, we have a wide range of technologies ranging from energy efficiency solutions, such as, and like I mentioned, LED bulb replacement, uh, to renewable energy from solar installations, to methane projects from abandoned oil wells and recovery of livestock animal waste. Uh, this again, gives us a diversified portfolio of different types of carbon credits. This protects us and our investors in case a specific type of credit falls out of favor, which some of them will at some point. And this also allows us to select the most impactful projects, again, with the highest ROI. So, Sunny, how many different types of carbon credits are there? It's something that we've kind of been talking about here, but you even mentioned that some carbon credits fall out of favor. How many types of carbon credits are there? Yeah, so I mean, it's it's really depending on the project. There's even within nature base, there's different types of nature base, right? There's reforestation, there's prevention of deforestation, and then all the different technologies that I mentioned. Um, you know, you have the energy efficiency, you have the renewable energy. So the list is fairly lengthy. I mean, I don't have a specific number, Corey, mm -hmm. but at the, at the end of the day, as long as whatever project we're looking at either sequesters the carbon or uh, reduces the emission or prevents the emissions from happening, you're able to generate carbon credits from it. And so there's, there's actually quite lengthy and um, the registries have a long list of methodologies as well for a lot of these types of projects. So um, this is really important because again, this is such a massive problem by having this wide range of carbon credits. It helps 
have more solutions and address the, the concern much quicker. Yeah, it really is a broad scope right now, especially in terms of this market, because it is so new and continuing to grow. Uh, what's the turnaround time from investment to verification of carbon credits to having the carbon credits in your portfolio? Yeah, this is an, an, another really good question. Um, the length of time will depend on two main variables. The first is how long it would take to implement the project. So take the LED bulb replacement ex example that's listed here. This would take roughly two to three months to put in place. On the other hand, the uh, solar installation project that's listed here can take roughly two years. The uh, second variable would be whether a methodology exists for that specific project or if a new one needs to be created within one of the registries. So we try to look for projects that have existing methodologies, which typically takes four to 12, team, four to 12 months, depending on the complexity and how backed up the registries are. Um, that's all it takes to, to get approved. But if a new methodology needs to be created, um, you can add another four to six months to that. Uh, for longer term projects, we can work on uh, creating the methodology in parallel with impl impl implementing the projects. So it wouldn't add to the length of putting the project in place. So the answer to your question, um, if it's a fairly simple one, simple project with a uh, methodology in place, it could be as short as four months. But for uh, longer projects like the solar installation, um, it could be uh, you know, roughly two, three years. Okay. Yeah, and it just depends on the project then, hey? project by project specific. That's correct. Okay. Thank you, Sonny. We can move on. Uh, this slide here just provides a good il illustration of the uh, geographic diversity of our projects. Uh, not only do we have a wide variety of technologies, we have access to projects of varying sizes in five different continents. And that includes developed nations, developing nations, and what the UN classifies as least developed nations. Again, so this further adds to the, the uh, diversity of our uh, portfolio. Now, the focus seems to be outside of, let's say, some of the powers in the world. Uh, is that going to continue to be the focus for the company? Yeah, because this is where they they have the most need, and it's going to be the most impactful as well. Plus, in a lot of these regions, uh, they're using fossil fuel burning uh, uh, plants for their electricity, so this is going to generate more carbon credits and uh, create a higher return. But that doesn't you know exclude us from uh, working with developed nations. Okay, will there be some deals coming in the U.S.? Do you think? Uh, actually, we, we we do have some already. We have several U.S. investments that we're in negotiations with. Uh, one is capping abandoned oil wells, and um, uh, this is one where we're starting in uh, New Mexico and Texas, but this can be done across many states. And then the second one is the subterranean sequestration of carbon in coal beds uh, happening in Wyoming. Now, is there any more complexities that come with getting deals done in some of the less developed nations? There, there are. There, there's some... Uh, potential geopolitical risk at times. But so we, we have to be very selective in which countries and nations we work with. And also we tend to try to work with the government as well, because once you bring them into the fold, it makes it much easier. Okay. So do you work mostly with governments and let's say smaller companies or are there any major companies that you could engage for long-term larger projects? Right now we're working more with small and medium companies that have relationship with the governments. And so we kind of work with both to ensure all the pieces are in place. Okay. Thank you. Here are uh, two of our projects where we have agreements in place. I uh, just want to touch on them in a little bit more detail. Uh, the first uh, is a light bulb project. It's an energy efficiency project where we're looking at eventually replacing all 4 million 100 watt incandescent bulbs in Equatorial Guinea with seven watt LED bulbs. This might not seem like a big deal, but when you consider the fact that most of the energy in Equatorial Guinea is from diesel powered generators, the 93% energy savings will reduce a significant amount of carbon. The reduction is enough to generate roughly 15 million carbon credits over the life of the LED projects. In addition, there are methodologies that already exist for LED conversions that make these credits eligible for both the voluntary and regulatory compliance market. Another reason we really like this project is because we don't have to invest in all 4 million bulbs at once. We could start with a half a container or about $450,000 worth of LED bulbs to ensure that the entire process runs smoothly. This significantly reduces our risk and then lastly, this project is very scalable and can be duplicated in other developing nations. So Equatorial Guinea only has a population of one and a half million people. Imagine taking this to a country like Nigeria with a population of over 216 million people. This project now has the potential to be 100x the size of Equatorial Guinea. Plus, we're already having preliminary discussions with two other countries. Um, our second project example is a, a new modular solar technology that is more efficient and rugged making them more suitable for warmer climates like that in Africa. Uh, the first will be a 20 megawatt installations uh, in Tunisia. Uh, this will replace coal generated power along with providing electricity to areas that lack access. 
once this is completed, we'll be able to uh, take this to another five developing nations that are already in discussions. Okay, so I think the project case study two there, that's straightforward. Project case study one, I know people would wonder, why did you get, how did you guys manage to get that deal? Because it seems like a fairly straightforward deal, going in there, replacing these light bulbs and generating carbon credits. Yeah, so it goes back to um, our, our network and our experience. Uh, I, I've worked with LEDs for well over a dozen years, and we have some uh, LED partners that, that are great that are starting to work with some of these countries and have relationships in Equatorial Guinea already. Uh, our partner actually has done a 10,000 bulb pilot that was extremely successful and saved the country quite a bit of money and also um, a lot of fuel. And now with the prices of fuel going up, this is even more critical. So it just goes back to our relationship and our experience, Corey. Okay, perfect, thank you. So one very important part we wanna to touch on is, uh, is one we have with the United Cities, North America. Uh, they're an arm of the United Nations Smart City Program created to advance the UN's sustainability development goals across cities throughout the world. Uh, not only are they a partner, the person that runs it is also on our advisory board. This partnership gives us access to pretty much every project they'll be working on. So for any project with carbon credit potential, we will have a right of first refusal to invest in them. In addition, we have the ability to take any project that we're working on in other locations like solar or, or the LED example and bring it to these smart city programs. This enhances our partnership with all these companies that we're working with well beyond just project financing. We can help them grow their business globally, which also provides a continuous flow of streaming opportunities while furthering the greater cause against, uh, against climate change. Are, is DevStream the only company that is working with the United Cities? Um, with, with this group, the United States of North America, uh, we're the only uh, carbon streaming company that's working with them, as far as I know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And what are some of the potential projects that you have through your partnership here? Yeah. So one, one example um, uh, is uh, United States North America. They're breaking ground on a 37,000 acre piece of land, which they plan on building a smart, sustainable city from the ground up. Um, again, so we can take some of our projects. And the example that we, we want to take to them is... Um, is this is the solar technology that I mentioned earlier. Uh, since the city is looking at having its own microgrid of renewable electricity, uh, it just makes perfect sense. And I've already had initial discussions with them about bringing this solar technology. And then at the same time, um, not only do we want to provide this renewable energy to the entire city and beyond, but also we're looking at providing, uh, uh, creating jobs by uh, putting in a factory to build these, these panels and build these uh, modules. Uh, and I provide jobs for the local population that currently has a high unemployment rate. So now we add that social impact as well. Yeah, you guys seem to keep circling around that social impact too. That's <laughs> nice to see. But essentially, the partnership with United Cities is another pipeline of projects for you. Yes, that's correct. That's okay. correct. Thank you. So in, in addition to our, our wide range of projects, um, our partnerships allow us to have a full end -to end carbon credit model. Uh, first is our relationship with Debio. Uh, we have exclusive rights to use their blockchain and ESG platform for carbon credits. Uh, over the last six years, Debio has created the, the most efficient and green blockchain available that, that I've seen. Uh, it can do over 8 million transactions per second at a cost that is roughly 1 1 millionth that of Ethereum. But more importantly, Debio has the most uh, energy efficient blockchain. Uh, and to give you an idea of the scale of energy efficiency, one transaction on Ethereum's blockchain uses more than 600 million joules of energy. One transaction on Devio's blockchain uses 2.1 joules. So if you're going to use a blockchain for an ESG platform or for carbon credit management, wouldn't it make sense to use the most energy efficient blockchain you can find? Um, for um, all our projects, like I mentioned before, you know, all the data necessary to generate carbon credits, along with all transactions around these credits are managed and stored on Devio's blockchain. With this platform, all stakeholders will know every piece of data used to calculate, say, the number of carbon credits, such as the uh, exact amount of kilowatt hours of energy generated from a solar project and the equivalent amount of carbon emissions that was prevented from the coal plant that it replaced. Uh, the ESG platform also provides additional sources for deals and liquidation. Many large companies and organizations will use the platform to get their ESG score and carbon footprint. When they see that their scores are not very good, uh, the platform provides multiple solutions for improvement. These include projects that DevStream can invest in or uh, options for these companies to um, buy carbon credits directly from DevStreams to uh, improve their carbon footprint. Uh, in addition to the uh, WSG platform, uh, we have a relationship with Expansive, which provides us with a global option to liquidate our carbon credits. 
Quick question then, are you guys DevStream the only one using blockchain for this sector? As far as so with the streaming companies, uh, the, the answer is yes. There are companies that are looking to add blockchain into the whole carbon credit space. Uh, there's other uh, some other smaller platforms. So I think it's it's great to see that. Uh, ultimately, we you know even with multiple uh, blockchains, if we all can kind of come together, it again helps solve the problem of uh, lack of trust and uh, double counting and, and uh, lack of transparency. So there are the answer to your question, Corey. There are some other companies uh, outside the streaming model, but other carbon and ESG companies do uh, looking at using blockchain. Okay. Yeah, it really makes sense. But Devio provides that different aspect of it with more of the E component, right? But, but um, let's also talk about how you sell the carbon credits. You have expansive here. You mentioned that it's carbon credit liquidity partner. Is that your main source of selling carbon credits when you build them up? Or would you look to larger corporations for some sort of a long-term, more sustainable contract? Yeah, it'll be both. Uh, Devio's WSG platform will have access to a lot of large corporations uh, who are looking to improve their carbon footprint. So we'll have access to be able to go create long-term contracts with them. We'll have direct ac access from relationships we have as well too. So it'll be a kind of combination of both. Okay. One other thing that I think you should outline is uh, I know through our initial conversations here that you're not using DevStream and the carbon credits that you generate necessarily to immediately sell, right? You are looking at storing and holding carbon credits as well. You're not looking for an immediate offtake. Yeah, that, that's correct. Um, our, our initial plan is to probably sell about 30% each year and hold on about 70% or roughly two thirds. And, it, and part of that is uh, unless we need to liquidate for capital for additional projects, we run a pretty uh, streamlined company um, and, and we don't need that, that capital, but also allows us to really take advantage of the appreciation and pricing. Because we touched on earlier, you know, the, the demand for carbon credit is going to go up significantly. So with that, it's going to be the pricing. So this allows us to take advantage of that. Okay. Is there anybody else using Expansive? Uh, I'm, I'm sure there are. I don't know the, the details, to be honest with you, Corey, but I would, I would assume so. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. But they are just a partner for you to help sell some carbon credits when that's, needed. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So I think we've... Um, we provided a nice overview of DevStream so far, and this slide gives just a good summary of what we've covered. Um, first, you know, DevStream has a diversified portfolio of projects. I mean, what makes us stand out is the wide range of technology-based solutions that we're working with. Uh, what makes many of these projects even more interesting is that they're very scalable, you know, like the LED bulbs I described earlier, and multiple projects that can be introduced in the same developers or region. So for example, the group that we're uh, doing a waste plastic recovery and reuse project uh, with, they're also interested in the LED project for, for their region. Um, our, our other technology advantage is that we just, uh, that we just covered on the previous slides our exclusive access to Devio's ESG platform and their blockchain. Uh, this also shows how streamlined we are in, uh, how we, we're in selecting a project and taking it all the way to monetization. Our process is fairly straightforward, right? Like I mentioned before, we get project leads literally every week. For each of these projects, our team does a quick analysis of whether carbon credits can be generated and certified. And we do an ROI analysis where we look for a worst case two year payback period, right? With a minimum 10 years of streaming revenue. Uh, we also look at the social impact of projects and if everything falls in line, we move forward with the funding and get the project started. Now, one aspect, quick question here. What about the verification process using Devio's blockchain compared to other competitors? Is it simply the low energy usage or is there another component there? Yeah, no, it's the low energy usage, but um, you know, if you take a look at the carbon credits in general, right, when the amount of carbon credits that are generated based on, um, um, it's based on the amount of carbon dioxide or equivalent greenhouse gas emissions that have been reduced or eliminated. And up to this point, much of that data is kept on spreadsheets or, or private databases. This could create a lot of uncertainty and also allow opportunities for less accurate accounting, you know, just like the uh, Columbia uh, project I, I shared earlier. And also for data manipulation, um, this is one of the major criticism of carbon credits. So what we plan on doing is to put all this data again on Devio's blockchain. So this will allow every piece, single piece of data that went into calculating the carbon credits along with every transaction around that carbon credit to be fully visible to all stakeholders at all time. This provides the much needed trust and transparency in the space. Do you think that increases the value of those credits then? Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah, that's why you have the low end cr credits that don't have that trust. So that, that's why they're selling for a couple dollars. Okay, got it. Thank you. So 
whenever you um, you have a large opportunity in a fast growing market, you're going to get a lot of players jumping in. And the carbon market is no exception. In the past six months alone, over half a dozen companies have emerged. Um, and to get a better view of how DevTree compares to all the others, um, I asked one of our advisors who, who has a ton of experience in carbon and sustainability, along with having direct relationships with many of these companies, I asked him to do a comparative assessment. What he came back with, which we also validate with our partners, is that DevTree is the only company with a focus on technology. All the other companies focus almost entirely on nature-based projects, with one having a few industrial projects. Uh, in addition, we're the only company utilizing blockchain for managing our credits. Regardless, the problem with climate change is massive and affects every company and organization in the world. This in turn creates a huge opportunity. So it's actually, it is a good thing that many of these carbon streaming companies have been created to help drive more solutions. Nevertheless, for investors looking to participate in the market, we do offer a uh, differentiated alternative. Why do you think there aren't other competitors? There clearly are going to be some more competitors coming into this technology-based solution, but why aren't there other ones now? Why? Well, I think a big part of it is the having the technology space and, and, and playing in the sustainable carbon space is two different worlds, and we just happen to intersect those. So if you look at all the other companies, they're focused mainly and almost exclusively on nature-based solutions, and that's what they know. And so until more of technology-type companies uh, start understanding the, uh, the carbon market a little bit better, we're going to be pretty much the exclusive company that, in, that plays in that space. And so as more and more companies, more, more streaming companies come up, they're going to play pretty much exclusively again in, in the nature-based area. Okay. So you do have competition, just DevStream setting itself apart because of the technology-based solution and uh, the wider scope that you guys can focus on? Yeah, that, that's, that's correct. I mean, I, I, it's almost like saying, you know, uh, you have two restaurants, right, that are competitors when one is a 60s diner while another is a French bistro, right? You kind of play in the same space, but it's very, very differentiated. Okay. So this is a timeline of, of DevStream. Um, in the past year, we've created our business model, assembled our team and board, established our partnerships, and put together a pretty comprehensive pipeline. Uh, we've also been able to raise 11 half million or almost 11 half million with, uh, with our go public financing round being almost 3x over subscribed. Uh, we had the option to raise a lot more capital, but did not want to have further dilution. Uh, we also want to limit the amount of free trading float to uh, 14 million shares to drive higher demand for our stock and increase shareholder value. This is significantly less than the other two streaming companies that are currently public. Uh, we expect to continue to close more streaming deals and um, have started a process for fall financing to uh, provide the necessary capital that will, that will allow us to grow. What do you think that necessary capital is? Because DevStream, it is capital intensive on the front end, right? Because you do need to provide capital. So what are you thinking of in terms of cash needed to really get moving? Yeah, a lot of it depends on how quickly we can uh, turn around some of our deals now and start generating carbon credits, because then that will alleviate the need for, for, for the capital, uh, having that stream of revenue. Mm -hmm. But we're looking at, you know, initially doing uh, 20, 25 million dollars secondary round and a little bit more after that. So nothing, nothing massive, because, again, we, we don't want to dilute our, our shares for our shareholders. OK. And in terms of when the stock will start trading and will you trade in the U.S.? Can you just isolate those two questions? Yeah, so our stock uh, will be should be trading by the end of this month and, and of March on the New York Exchange, and then uh, you know sometime after that we'll we'll start uh, deciding on whether we want to uplist into uh, into the U.S. Uh, but then the current plan is to do so at some point, but you know we still need to see how the market reacts to our company, what we're doing, and uh, and also uh, how the project goes. Okay, a couple of questions too on share structure coming in, in terms of founder shares and the allocation, but I think we'll get to that one soon, won't we? Yeah, actually, perfect timing. So that's that's the, uh, the next slide. Yeah, so here's here's a summary of our share structure. Um, after our, completing our 10 million go public round, we have uh, 73.7 shares outstanding, or 73.7 million shares outstanding. Excuse me. 63% hmm. uh, of these shares are insider and management holding, and 78% uh, of them are under a 36 month escrow. So for our IP, IPO, like I said, we will only have a float of 14 million shares. Um, and as you can see, I mean, we've, we're, we've worked extremely hard to build a structure that is tightly held by strategic investors. Now, somebody is asking about founder shares. Are there many founder shares within this structure? Yeah, there are. Um, so uh, as I mentioned here, 63% uh, um, of them are insider management holding. And so the founder shares is uh, roughly a little bit more, more than half, uh, about 16% or so. 
uh, with uh, half of them going to uh, to Devio, our, our sister parent company. Okay, yeah, the Devio aspect is a is one that we could talk about too. What role does Devio play? How many shares do they hold in total? Yeah, Devio owns uh, fifty percent, roughly fifty percent, a little bit more, like fifty point eight percent, I believe, of the upstream. Uh, with the shares being locked up for 36 months and um, they they provide the, uh, the necessary technology to help really drive our business okay then in terms of warrants and options the difference between the basic and the fully diluted here general st- strike price on any of those yeah so we do have some warrants with a strike price of a dollar 50 um and uh i believe that that's that's the only warrants we have at this point okay so really coming out of the gate though there's not going to be a whole lot of free trading shares in the whole scheme of things no, and that and again, that was done on purpose to uh, protect our shareholder value. Okay, thank you. And then uh, now we come to the end of our presentation. So I'd just like to summarize what we just discussed. Um, first is that our mission, first and foremost, is to find and help accelerate as many solutions as possible for this massive problem we have in climate change. Uh, because we work with such a wide range of technologies, uh, we have a very diverse portfolio of projects. Uh, second, we are the only streaming company we're aware of that addresses all three facets of ESG. Uh, like other streaming companies, the primary focus of our projects is to address the environmental problem. In addition to that, we do look for projects with social impact, like some examples I share with you. And then by using Debian's blockchain and ESG platform, all our carbon credits will have full governance. Third, our key partnerships allow us to have a full end-to-end carbon model where we're able to address everything from project origination through liquidation. Fourth, this carbon market, where we're one of the early movers and the first to focus on technology, is already massive and still growing. Uh, you know, like I mentioned this before, the voluntary market is expected to grow by 100x by the year 2050, while the regulatory compliance market is already over $850 billion. So we're looking close to a trillion dollar market. Uh, and even with, that, with other streaming companies popping up, this market is big enough for all of us. And last, as I previously shared, uh, we have a diverse and talented team with plenty of experience in technology, sustainability, and carbon. Okay. Does that wrap us up? We can get into some questions. We have a lot of questions that came in. We're not (laughs) going to be able to get to all of them, but I will be having Sonny back on uh, my show to address more of these questions. But Sonny, let's start off with a couple that came in early on. Uh, One simply asked, why don't companies that need to offset CO2 do it themselves by implementing some of their own policies and procedures? Oh, that's a great question. There are are a few companies that do that, but for for the most part, like you know, I mentioned before, finding a a project and then uh, creating a carbon credit and then certifying it, it is a long and tedious process. For for a lot of companies where they're already cash rich or they they want to focus on their core comments, it is much easier to uh, fund other projects through carbon credits. And so for them, they prefer to buy carbon credits. And also, it also um, it allows new technologies and new solutions to come about by utilizing the financing from these carbon credits. So it, it is a really positive thing that companies uh, are playing in the carbon credit space and purchasing carbon credits to help advance some of these technologies. Okay. Well, to that point, we're going to see more entrances in the carbon credit market. Is there a point where we have too many carbon credit mark or too many carbon credit companies that are building up these carbon credits? No, that's another great question. And uh, I think David really hit it really well, where he talked about a couple of large companies, Shell, Microsoft, where you know, Shell alone could buy one third of the available carbon credits today. Again, this project is so massive where if we get to the point where there's too much carbon credits, that actually is a really good thing because that means we're getting really close to solving uh, global climate change. And so for now, it's we're, we're, we're nowhere near that. So uh, I, I don't think we're, we're gonna have that problem for at least another decade or so. Uh, and then uh, and then at that point, hopefully, like I said, climate change is, has been addressed and then you know, we move into another asset. Yeah, fair enough. Well, and that ties into another question and said, what happens if there are not enough carbon credits? I guess that just means carbon credit prices go up. That's right. That's the case right now and will continue to be so, I think, for for a long time. And what that means is that uh, carbon credit pricing will go up, uh, which means there will be newer technologies that come about. And some of the technologies right now that are very expensive, like direct air capture, where uh, we we know a couple of companies are costing $800 to $1,000 per ton to sequester carbon. Well, all of a sudden, those projects and those technologies become viable. And so it's it's, it's like in, in any other market, supply and demand, right? As supplies go up, and, uh, the, the price goes down. But if demand goes up and supplies don't uh, you know stay in line with it, then the price is going to go up. 
and to that point with new markets too, companies get more efficient companies figure out ways to generate some more credits and to alleviate or eliminate some of the uh, pollution that goes on out there. So it's a it's a always changing market. Uh, another question here, does the quality of carbon credits scale proportionally with its price? Or is there a Goldilocks zone, so to speak? No, that's an interesting one. It's I wouldn't say there's a Goldilocks zone, but and, and it's usually the other way around. The price is dictated by the uh, type of carbon credit and the value of carbon credit. And then also at the same time, there's certain ones that are going to fall in and out of favor, uh, depending on what the end buyer wants. So you know, there's multiple facets that uh, affect that. But on the bottom line, the overall market, the price is going to go up. It's just in some areas going to go up faster than others. Okay. Now, is there a ratings agency or some third party out there that validates these credits? Because we've heard from you and David that like, it sounds like these carbon credits are off balance sheet, on balance sheet, on a blockchain, <laughs> not on a blockchain. How do we get a better handle on that? Yeah, no, that's 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 a, another great question. So let's take a look at the two markets. You have the regulatory market and the voluntary market. The regulatory market is much tighter. So in, in those situations, you don't have as much of the, the issues with uh, lack of trust and transparency, but also for the regulatory market, it's a lot more difficult to get those type of carbon credits. Uh, but at the same time, they're worth a lot more. They're worth almost a, a 10X multiplier. The voluntary market is still very loosey-goosey, much like the Wild Wild West. And, and that's where you have all those factors that you mentioned, where on, on balance sheet, off balance sheet, sometimes they're double counted. And so this is why we're trying to change that by adding the blockchain piece, because now you create that transparency and that provenance as well. So as more and more companies do that and more and more companies fall into that, um, into that methodology, then I think everything's going to get more and more clean. Okay. Yeah, it's still such a new market. All right. Yeah. We have run for an hour here. I'll ask you one more question, let you give a big picture outlook. This is kind of a softball question, but why not end on this? <laughs> You're kind of a unique company in this space. Do you see yourself becoming the leader in this space? Well, we would like to think so. We, th we like to think we, 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 we are the leader and we'll become the leader. But like I said before, even, even if we're not, even if we're just you know one of many players, I think that's okay because our mission, our ultimate goal is to do what's right to help solve climate change. And if if we succeed and other people succeed, you know, this market is so massive. I, I mean, I'd be extremely happy. Okay. Hey, Sonny, thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you for all the questions. As I mentioned, we did not have time to get to all of them. I will be having Sonny on the show in the next couple of weeks to address the questions that were left over. And please send me the rest of your questions. Again, Fleck, F-L-E-C-K, at kereport.com. When I get Sunny back on the show, well, we'll be sure to cover all of these questions and continue to follow along. This is a very interesting story here, Sunny. So, Sunny, thank you very much for your time today. And Corey, thank you. Thank you for having me on our show. I've, I really enjoyed myself.